Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Father Thomas Keating. Thomas is the former abbot of the Trappist Monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts, and one of the foremost teachers of contemplative prayer in the Christian world. He and others have recovered the way of centering prayer and founded an organization, Contemplative Outreach, to encourage the practice among monks, clergy, and lay people. He has spoken to prayer disciples in all parts of the world and participated in dialogues with contemplatives of other religions. Among his published books is Open Mind, Open Heart, The Contemplative Dimension of the Gospel. <clears throat> Father Thomas lives in Snowmass, Colorado. And uh, I'll be linking to his website, and there's a much longer bio on that, and as well as a list of his many publications. So, Father Thomas, I'm honored to have you as my guest this week. I've really enjoyed reading a couple of your books, and I've, I've really been looking forward to this. Thank you. I thought I would start by asking you some very fundamental questions, maybe even metaphysical, and uh, then we could move on to a, a kind of a your idea of the roadmap of the territory from sort of initial awakening to spiritual interest to its culmination. And then finally, uh, we can talk about centering prayer and contemplative prayer. How does that sound? I'm with me. <laughs> okay, I knew it would be. <laughs> Good. So let me start with the, probably the most fundamental question. Uh, you know, in re reading your books, the word God is mentioned many, many times. So please define for us, if you will, what you understand or experience God to be. What is God? Uh, of course, this is a very difficult term in uh, inter-spiritual or inter-religious dialogue because uh, there's as many ideas of God as there are people, I guess. Mm -hmm. And God was used originally in the Hebrew Bible uh, in the uh, in contradistinction to the other local gods of different city-states. So it was pretty much uh, not even a national deity, but uh, people looked to an, some entity, some higher power to protect them from their enemies and so forth. So it would be nicer if we had another word for God. But if you start getting uh, too metaphysical and just quote the Hebrew Bible, I am who I am, or I am that I am, that uh, is discussed by many scripture scholars, uh, that's about the best description of God, which is isness without any limit. I amness uh, without any other pronoun. Uh, nothing can describe God and, and, and the Buddhists have done well in establishing a an attitude towards the uncreated God or the unmanifest God uh, as distinct from the God of creation or the creator God it's the same God of course but God here or as I will use it is simply a label because it's the one I'm used to in my uh, tradition and I don't know of any other that you can use. Maybe someone uh, can invent one. <laughs> God doesn't care. He's everything. You call him Butch if you like. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, now, you know, there's this sort of tussle that's been going on between science and religion for quite some time, but when I look at anything of a scientific nature, if I look at a, a presentation on astronomy, for instance, or a Discovery Channel show about the microscopic world, or you know, listen to a quantum physicist, or, I, you know, I, to me, I'm hearing and seeing God. You know, that's what they're talking about. This this incredible, explosive, infinite creativity that's micromanaging every subatomic particle, and yet at the same time managing the galaxies. Um, yes, well, you've got the, uh, certainly the right idea as far as uh, as a uh, as a, a Christian perspective, especially that of the mystics. But of course, one's idea of God changes as one's own consciousness uh, matures, and one uh, gives up uh, treating God as a kind of uh, 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 dependency or. Or, or gets into codependent attitudes towards God, or, 
or even demanding attitudes towards God. But the main thing is to have a big idea of God, huge, and the science, both the infinitesimal aspects of it and the grandiose uh, astronomical aspect of it, are presenting us with a new cosmology that religion has to take into account, mm. especially the Christian tradition. Our scriptures are really based on a uh, on a, a a view of God that is patriarchal and and limited by the culture, and uh, it just doesn't work anymore that cosmology. So, mm. so theology needs a solid or a, a reasonable cosmology in which to build a theology that will appeal to people of our time I think especially in the in the near future if not already so um, would you be comfortable in using the the omni adjectives for God omnipresent omniscient omnipotent does that jibe with your experience of God or intuitive sense of God uh, yes, but they're a little too metaph metaphysical. They come from an essentialist metaphysics of the Middle Ages, which was a, a great tool of research and did a good job, but has severe limitations because God is, uh, uh, has aspects that are beyond reason. That is to say, they don't reject reason. But reason isn't enough. I mean, how do you resolve infinite justice and infinite mercy? Well, you don't on the rational level. It remains a mystery, a contradiction. You have to open your consciousness to a, uh, a synthesis of the two and transcend the rational concept of God. Uh, it's only there in the experience of that transcendent presence that one perceives that that God is is in everything without being limited to anything mm. and so is dynamic is, is expanding uh, God is is change itself and that's what's changeless about him mm. so the uh, the dynamic idea of God that that uh, evolutionary cosmology has provided with us very recently, only in the past 50 years in a convincing way, is, is, a, is a revelation of a higher power in which we're immersed and engulfed and can never be separated from because we have really no identity except what has emerged in the evolutionary process. So creation is not a one-time event it's always happening and in a sense being in God is always becoming becoming what? everything because he's const constantly producing everything the human consciousness is really uh, God experiencing uh, human consciousness mm. and that means that uh, we're a, we're a kind of icon of God, as Bernard Lonigan put it. And, and, and this is why humans are so important and are so dignified, uh, because God dwells in them and is calling them into a certain, uh, I perhaps shouldn't say equality, but equality as far as that's possible for human limitation, even after it's been glorified by the uh, the infinite gifts of uh, of the almighty so whatever you say of god you have to be prepared to say the opposite because he doesn't fit into any affirmative statement mm. if you say he is you have to be willing to say he isn't he isn't anybody you can think of that's for sure and so one of the main breakthroughs of the spiritual journey is to perceive that God is is really us, is manifesting in us and inviting us uh, to become fully human because that's the way to become as fully divine as humans can be in this evolutionary process. But we don't know the end, but there's no reason why it should stop. We've been coming out of amoebas for billions of years, and, and we haven't stopped 
the brain is still evolving without question. Mm. I have a friend who likes to refer to us as sense organs of the infinite. You know, like we, but by that token, and if we consider yeah. if we consider God to be omnipresent, and the, then not only are we sense organs of the infinite, but but dogs are, and mosquitoes are, and you know whatever, all everything, even rocks, we could say everything expresses or reflects that to the best of its ability in terms of its physical structure. Yes, all that is very congenial to my way of thinking, and uh, I think that that the that the uh, development of consciousness from the infant who starts out with almost zero uh, self consciousness begins to build a self that is uh, dependent on on parents and teachers and culture and its experience, its temperament, its limitations. So the world that we see and, and are judging all the time and everybody else is judging is very prejudiced. It's seen through my dark glasses or my tinted glasses. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the world is unreal, not because it is unreal, but because our view of it is unreal and built on the illusions of what it, we want it to be and our appetite for control and uh, pleasure and uh, and above all security so the spiritual life involves recognizing these as illusions as our false self and and detaching ourselves from them without expecting that these problems are going to go away or that suffering is going to disappear it's precisely to lead this divine life in human circumstances, which involves both suffering and great joy, and is continuing to evolve. We don't know where it's going. We can perhaps destroy that process or that possibility by our naive aspects of technology. We have to learn to take responsibility for the world that we're in. And this we're very reluctant to do because it limits some of our uh, desired freedoms or license, you might say. Our short-term goals. Um, yes. So if, if ultimately, essentially, when you get right down to it, we are God looking out through these eyes, and I think you kind of hinted around, you know, that if, yes. if you go to our very core, that's who and what we are, um, then... To what extent can that be realized, number one? And if it is realized fully, say in the, in the, in the person of someone like Jesus Christ, uh, then does one actually rise above the possibility of suffering? I mean, from the, from the perspective of suffering, people looked at Jesus and said, oh, he must be suffering terribly. From his perspective... Was he really, if he was fully one with God, or, or was he residing in a sort of a transcendent, you know, um, haven that was beyond anything the physical body was being subjected to? Well, you're talking about theological issues, and you but, can look. But at they're the real. Though, you know, they're real issues. <laughs> different aspects. I yeah. Think, yeah, it's a very important point to understand suffering, and most of us are too busy getting away from our own personal ones to think about it too much unless you're thrust or immersed into terrible suffering as many people are today. What does it, what does it mean? And I think this is where your cosmology even comes in. Uh, what does evolution mean? Does it mean that you're going to evolve out of suffering altogether while still in this life? That's not the promise. The promise is that we're, we're developing our capacities of human beings to do the things that God does with the greatest of ease. Forgive, show compassion, respect everyone, experience oneness with everyone, and identify with everyone. Well, in the Christian perspective, God has identified with human nature even in its spiritual poverty or sinfulness or alienation from himself. And, and that says 
so much about God. Why would God want to identify with such a a uh, uh, helpless and spiritually destitute group of people who are certainly the lowest intellectual beings we know of in the universe? They may improve some more. But right now, they're pretty childish. Oh, we're pretty childish in many of our social uh, choices. But God is, uh, is, uh, doesn't look at suffering the way we do. If you, there's a certain interrelatedness of the Christian mysteries so that the Trinity is, is the great mystery, that somehow God is a community, that they're not three persons as we understand person, but there are three relationships there that treat us in a personal way since we're persons. So, so God seems to adjust himself to every creature and their level of consciousness, however primitive. And uh, the, uh, what Jesus has done is to integrate the human condition with all its limitations with which he completely identified as a human being. He didn't he threw away all the divine privileges insofar as he was human. And, and just uh, showed us how to be human in a divine way, which involves the acceptance and the realization of being called to this incredible uh, compassion and unity of God and oneness with each other. That seems to be the program to change what is most opposite to God or distant from God or alienated from God into divine love itself and in this way to manifest what is perhaps one of the deepest realities of God which is his humility he doesn't care about being God he has everything he wants nothing except to pour out this goodness and love on those who are willing to accept it but in the condition in which we have a certain freedom so evolution means once humans begin to have a certain choice limited though it is then then God can't control everything that happens in the same way and still respect the uh, gift he's given us of of, uh, of autonomy in some degree it sounds, it's reminiscent of an adolescent, you know, maturing into adulthood. At a certain point, the parent has to grant them a certain degree of autonomy exactly. and freedom, and, and it's a very risky business, and they might, you know, go off and do crazy things, but if, if that freedom isn't granted, they'll never grow into adults. Right, and, and parents need to trust children even when they make mistakes, because everybody makes mistakes in this society even though we have some social uh, inhibitions from people who think we should do well. <laughs> this making a mistake is human, and, and God is not put off by... He gives us a million or a, perhaps a trillion chances. So there's, there's no lack of generosity or abundance from God's part. But This whole... Discussion points to some point. It points to something that I find fascinating. I, I tried to write out a question to to really express it clearly, but in that, I'll, so I'll just read it. And maybe we can make sense of it. Sure. Um, is is loss of wholeness a necessary condition for manifestation? If somehow all the parts maintained full awareness of their essential nature as wholeness, it seems there wouldn't be any impetus for diversification. The tendency would be to merge back into wholeness. Um, and, and actually some enlightened people have reflected just this. They practically have to be fed to be kept alive, um, while others have become more dynamic and, and engaged in the world. But I don't know if that was clear, but in, if, you, if you imagine sort of the Big Bang and the manifestation of the universe, it almost seems that God necessarily has to play a hide-and-seek game with himself where he creates these parts and, and appears to get lost in them, even though he essentially is the parts, the well, parts, the parts are not... you a question. Go for it, yeah. Uh, what do you do if you are infinite, and have infinite happiness and don't need anything? What do you do to occupy yourself? 
you get bored and you say, hey, let's have some fun. Then let's, what do you do? Let's play. Let's create something. Play. That's yeah. you. In other words, there's a playful character to God. He wants to see what these creatures can do or will do in different circumstances. And this enables him, by his identification with us, to feel what it's like to be human with our limitations mm. and to love us in our weakness and uh, spiritual poverty and and to love healing us and to love forgiving us all the things we find hard to do is what makes God apparently happiest so uh, I came I across a quote from uh, St. Teresa of Avila she said it appears that even God is on the journey so, so in other words, this whole process of the universe, it's one big evolution machine, which is like God's spiritual practice. <laughs> yes, it's finding out what it's like to be human with a certain freedom yeah. and with uh, enormous limitations, which hopefully are getting better, I mean, very slowly and not too obviously. But you hit the nail on the head when you say God likes to play hide and seek. That's a, That's a classical game mm. but that doesn't mean that he wants to cause us suffering but that there's so much to learn from a game and one of the great things to learn from a game is that it's designed to have fun not to accomplish something so as soon as you want to win you've lost uh, the pleasure of playing and uh, a certain amount of competition uh, not too bad but the game is over once you make it a career <laughs> and and this is there are lots of other games God plays one another one he likes very much is let's pretend or uh, or again uh, let's do it again like a child high jo joy of knocking down a stack of blocks and then oh daddy let's do it again so, so he has this marvelous uh, apparently playful attitude but he also can play rough and uh, he wants to see if we're willing to join him in, in the game of uh, the most serious of games is that of, of, of healing the wounds of the world and of becoming whole which is the same idea as salvation or redemption and we're aware of having this capacity for boundless happiness that's, that's the greatest proof of God's presence is that even in strange ways people are always looking for happiness even if it's uh, malicious if that's their idea of happiness mm. well it's like you said earlier we're our, our perception of reality gets filtered through the, these lenses of our perception and, and becomes quite distorted in the process in most cases or at least at certain stages of our development so that we, we think it's going to make us happy to kill somebody or rob a bank or yes. you know, yes. things like that. If you see yes. me looking back like this every now and then, it's like I have dogs coming in and out. <laughs> I let them in and out throughout these interviews. <laughs> well, it's kind of them to keep silent and not bark. They don't always do that, actually. <laughs> um, well, this, this thing you mentioned a minute ago about God likes to play rough sometimes. Um, I mean, there are probably inhabited planets throughout this vast universe that are routinely smashed to smithereens by asteroids, you know, and, and, all, and, we, and this planet alone is evidence enough that all kinds of horrible things can happen. And of course, you know, thinkers and, and philosophers have pondered this for millennia, and there's been books like Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People, and, and so on. But uh, let me hear you your comment on, on this thought. Um, would it have been possible for God to have set up a universe which didn't have polarities? It seems that the, the very nature of relativity is that you have, if you're going to have hot, you have to have cold. If you're going to have fast, you have to have slow. And if you're going to have happiness, you have to have suffering. Well, that's the human condition. <laughs> and that's the way we were made in an evolutionary process towards wholeness, not a possession of wholeness from the beginning. So... Uh, I think it's a, a good idea to remember that once God creates anything, he's in trouble. 
because it it got going to be God if it's a creature. Ah, yeah, it doesn't good. have all power. So in in creating out of his goodness uh, creatures to share his happiness, he's he's uh, taking the long view that. Uh, it's not going to be hunky dory all the time in certain situations that have to evolve for people to begin to to be able to accept God, even when He plays rough. Mm. Well, so, if it if it is all about play, I mean, you know, when you not watch... all about it's the, it's an aspect of the right of of reality that there's a playful side. So. It's a serious game, or it's a serious situation. But I don't know. But it's also true that God has a, has a great sense of humor and likes to play, and would like us to understand that some things He does is a game and not take it too seriously. Mm. Uh, so once you have creatures with free will, anything can happen. And perhaps that's why God made it this way. He, if the Father in the Trinitarian relationships is infinite possibilities, and the Son is the articulation of those possibilities in actuality, and the Spirit is the complete surrender of each of those relationships to each other in the in in, in total oneness. So, uh, so God is. Is, is always infinitely one and infinitely diverse at the same time. The relationships couldn't be more different. The, the father and the son can never be made into one on every level. There's a relationship that is distinctive. And so uh, we're invited into this uh, dynamic of, of self-giving, and this is our problem. I think creatures don't like being creatures. They they want to be in control. They want to be in charge of their efforts and success and and draw attention to themselves, which is not what God is. He just is. He doesn't need any attention and he doesn't need any adulation. We need it in order to remember that that we're created out of nothing. As soon as you can fully accept that, and I emphasize fully, you can become everything. You can be God too. But God can't uh, support something that's not true. And we're not God by nature, but we are invited to become God by grace. The sheer gratuitive love of God sharing his, his goodness, which means, of course, compassion, forgiveness, respect, oneness. These are the real human essence of the human person that uh, is just barely beginning to emerge apart from special exceptions. And, and perhaps, as many anthropologists are beginning to think, the evolutionary process is at a critical level in our time in which a new general level of consciousness beyond rational, the capacity to understand reality intuitively, may be beginning to happen around the world. And so the globalization of the world may be an opportunity in which the higher power can revealed to people more and more at the same time these insights into ultimate reality that we uh, we haven't been able to reach on the rational level and can't because of the nature of that particular level of consciousness. Mm. Someone once brought up the metaphor to me that 
back 2,000 years ago in the, in the time of Christ and Buddha, the, it was as if there were a very thick membrane that had to be penetrated in order to realize God and to, get, to become enlightened. But now that membrane has been getting penetrated over and over again so many times that it's become quite porous. And the, you know, the price of entry is much lower now. It's, it's easy. People are having all these awakenings all over the place. Uh, quite spontaneously sometimes, even without doing any spiritual practice, at least that they can remember in this life. Yes, it, it's interesting that many uh, people who are, can, I think, reasonably be believed about their spiritual experience are, are pointing to invisible energies that science hasn't taken into its uh, reckoning as yet, but which it needs to do because of the increasing um, evidence that such energies exist. What holds the body together? It's, a, it's trillions of cells with no apparent head office or uh, center of activity so that consciousness is a, is a communion of all the possibilities of human body, mind and spirit and a kind of synthesis of all levels of creation as of now. So the, the, the human as an icon of God is, is worth reflecting on Bernard Lundigan's insight. Hmm. If That's we try sort of... to resolve difficulties on the rational level, you just get into emotional turmoil. Hmm. You To accept them, sit with them, wait them out, give them to God. This is the best way to deal with suffering according to the mystics of all the world traditions. And perhaps to learn to embrace paradox, you know, to, in, to encompass to get used ir irreconcilable to. notions within one <laughs> noggin. <laughs> yes. If you, and this is why meditation is so important because it's probably the, the most direct access to our deeper capacities for, for consciousness beyond the rational level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. People, uh, one of the great uh, questions uh, is who are you? And, and uh, adolescents are said to take great interest in that question. It certainly isn't our resume or what you tell a doctor and you're going to see a new one about your life. It's not about our personality in which our character and our education are, are expressed in the details of our behavior and our major way of looking at the world. So beyond the... the uh, egoic self, it's usually called, is, is a self that we don't normally uh, access except through meditation or prayer or some especially invasion of God's presence into our uh, life, which is totally gratuitous. So uh, at the deepest level, even the true self suggests there's a deeper self even than that. And, and, uh, and this is our understanding of, of who we really are, the manifestation of God in our spiritual poverty and weakness and in the difficulties of human nature. Somehow who God is is expressed in that experience of, of human weakness. Not too many people understand that yet. In meditation, by sitting long enough, the dust begins to settle or the dirt in the pool or the other images and you begin to see more, more clearly that, that the deepest self is, the deepest level of consciousness is, is God consciousness manifesting in each of our uniqueness as a human being. But it also means that we're completely united with everyone else in the species because God is just as much in everyone else. So, but to me, this is one of the great gifts of the evolutionary cosmology 
and of science today and why religion uh, has to listen to science because it's really giving us up-to-date revelations on who God is and, and developing a cosmology that can possibly support a, 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 a deep union and unity with God. But what, what is being revealed is everything is interconnected and interrelated in the material universe. Right. And can and functions in community or communion with other things. And as you go up the level of consciousness, the the communion or the presence or or the presence and the action of God in everything that happens, not just presence, but presence and action. And that, that action is healing us of the unconscious wounds of growing up in childhood and of human trauma and at the same time activating all the capacities of grace, which are the uh, Christian scheme of things, the fruits and gifts of the Spirit. So, so it God manifesting in us that is the true, uh, the ultimate or the truest self. And in this perspective, death is not the end, but the completion of the human journey that prepares us finally to move beyond all human support and 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 all possessiveness just to be who we are and to be content with that uh, it's just a, death is just a pit stop <laughs> um do you there's so many so when you speak it's so rich i could spring 10 questions out of each statement but um perhaps the one I'll bring out of that one since it was brought up right towards the end um, do you I know this is not part of official Christian doctrine but do you personally believe in reincarnation do you feel that the soul sort of carries on from life to life and evolves in that way or does that not fit for you well it doesn't appeal to me uh -huh. at least from my experience in, in my view as, and it seems to me to be enriched by the uh, by the discoveries of our time. Uh, people have past life experiences that are that they uh, are very strong, but now we know that everything is recorded uh, in our body somewhere, and maybe there's some master database somewhere, or Jupiter or something, <laughs> and and everything that has ever happened is recorded in me. Nothing dies except what is, what is false, which is the false self. That's what dies. But you don't really have to die physically to die uh, to the uh, illusions of the false self. But, uh, so when you have a past life experience, are you saying that you're picking up on somebody else's memory that was recorded in the, could cos be in the cosmic computer? Because yeah. of the oneness of human nature, you think it's your own because of the intuitive connection but it might not be however I'm not, I don't know and so I'm happy to I uh, certainly respect that you know, so many people believe in it and I think it could be both uh, perhaps yeah I, well just it's just that the vast majority of humanity obviously did not end up at the pinnacle of human spiritual evolution you know yes, and, and, that's and, great, uh, so what happens to them do they get another chance or what you know that's the great question. I don't think you're ever going to get a complete answer because it's part of our of the package of total trust that we need to have to surrender completely to God. It doesn't matter what happens as long as it's God's will because he, that will is one of infinite love and compassion and is, is trying to bring us into our particular contribution to the evolutionary process. Now, um, you can't do that without a community, that is, without oneness with other folks, without learning from other folks. The human nature is pretty limited up till now, mm -hmm. and uh, it needs the uh, support, the encouragement, the trust, the love of a community to become fully human. But there's a lot of interesting information about dying now. Actually, it, and many hospice people are beginning to say that 
the dying process is itself a transformative process. I mean, you go through the stages that Kubler-Ross identified and, and, and that as you go through them, they become stages of, of liberation and freedom and one moves from perhaps denial uh, to anger, to fear, to acceptance, to peace, to joy, and so. If death, death, if death is gradual, so I suppose you could do that. Well, for God, isn't it limited by time? So That's he true. can do in a nanosecond of time <laughs> all of those things. Mm. But uh, it's a good question because that. Uh, in other words. We're always looking at reality or the biggest events in it. from our limited perspective with our tinted glasses. What did we hear in kindergarten or from our parents or from our uh, important others? And you have to graduate from those attitudes or at least reevaluate them in later education and especially in adolescence and college. and. Uh, we need to provide younger people with opportunities to discuss these basic issues of life more than they seem to have in most universities today and their preoccupation with with uh, drink and sex <laughs> yeah and following a career path hey, that's the way it was when I was in college and that's the way it still is apparently Yep. But it's childishness, but it's a way of growing uh, their own, uh, I guess, decisions. And, and it's in that state of uncertainty that they need to be loved by parents because we've all made more or less the same mistakes. And, we, mm. and people will not recover from advice, but from love, from being loved in their mistakes, I think. You've mentioned the, the false self several times. Perhaps we should get into that. Um, in your book, you outline a very, in very great detail how the false self gets formed and how eventually it is seen through. And in contemporary spiritual circles, there's a lot of talk of no self or you know there being no no one home, so to speak, and so on. So I think it'd be and you know being egoless and so on. So I think it'd be interesting to uh, to discuss this for a few minutes. Well, there's some, uh, some very good books on the subject. Uh, Thomas Merton has one mm -hmm. from a contemplative perspective. Uh, you have to uh, take steps as you grow in self-consciousness to protect the, uh, the life that we have and, and our interests and so on. And so the false self is really uh, a, a project to build a self out of what we perceive to be sources of happiness or gratification. So, so security symbols are very important for the infant. Uh, affection and esteem symbols are very important. And uh, some degree of independence, the desire for control and power. And, and these are, are normal and necessary to survive in infancy. But since there's no other program to judge these by or standards, they tend to become not just needs but demands. And since everybody else has the same needs and demands, you're in for social conflict unless you have some uh, principles. And here is where a wise uh, religious instruction could be extremely helpful in preparing the human psyche for maturation and going beyond uh, the, the gratification when it's excessive of those three energy centers, you might say, uh, only produces frustration. And then come the, the, the afflictive emotions and then you're in various moods for hours, days, years, or a lifetime. <laughs> so. The false self doesn't exist. It's all up here. But it sounds like you're saying that even though ultimately it doesn't exist, it's necessary to form one in order to function as a human being. Would it be possible for a child to grow well, up without forming one at all? Maybe, now it might be better to call that ego. 
Uh -huh. Ego is a is the development of the necessary and good sides or, or human values that are involved in development. It's the exaggeration of them, the fixation of them, or the addictive process that the false self begins that leads to exaggeration, and hence it's impossible to realize because everyone else is trying to do the same uh, foolish thing. If, of squeezing gratification out of out of sense information which is meant to give pleasure but can't give permanent pleasure. So and in your experience have you ever seen an example of anyone who has gone through infancy and adolescence uh, and formed a healthy functional and necessary ego without forming what you call a false self? Well, it would be, I'd have to think a long time. <laughs> I, I know I certainly didn't. <laughs> some certainly uh, try. But, but the information that I would consider essential for human growth is missing in ordinary education because there's so, uh, such care not to impose a religious attitude on children, which is perhaps correct. There's not a universal set of ethical values that you could present to a child that would help it to see the value of moderation in its desires and uh, and uh, uh, openness to relationship even with people we don't like. Uh, certainly uh, openness with people with different, who are different from us. So are you saying that the the absence of proper ethical training is is the main culprit in the um, common in the in the development of a false self and the fact that it's so predominant in our society? Well, I think you you need some basic ethics, but here is another problem: we don't have a common ethic among the world religions, and uh, or no religion. So uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in, in his book Beyond Religion and in his activities in recent years is trying to develop a, an ethic that is built on human nature and that everybody can identify with. And that no, I, re no religion would have a problem with, presumably. Yes, it would have to be very general and then each religion would have to add the particularity uh, particularities of each uh, uh, that are uh, uh, special to their tradition. But uh, His Holiness, I think he had two when I uh, last heard him speak. Uh, uh, if I can remember them, uh, one was the unity of the human race. Uh, if, if we could just believe the revelations of science today, which, which uh, in in microbiology and other sciences shows how how unified the development of cells and those structures of a living body are. We might be able to uh, just from the facts of science realize that the, the humans are, uh, are inseparable from one another, even to the point. And this is maybe this is. Uh, too much under the influence of religion, but it's common to all humanity that once you accept oneness as a principle of inter uh, human relationships, then you are responsible for everyone else's uh, needs and sufferings. And, and most people are not about to take that on unless they're strongly motivated. No man is an island. It's exactly, and and if I'm suffering, everyone else is is is, is touched by this. As one of the uh, quantum mechanic people said, uh, you can't have a thought without influencing everything in the universe instantaneously. So even a thought, our thoughts about others, or our judgments of others are affecting society in ways that we don't understand yet or we don't realize the damage that negative thinking can produce or especially negative acting like 
vengeance and re- no good has ever come from violence that <laughs> that has any permanency to it. and yet that's that's the regression that most humans go through in difficulties they regress to the level of animals which is revenge so it's this evolutionary process that is stuck or stalled on a midpoint in which we can't go back to the irresponsibility of the beast and we can't go forward into divine union without the grace of God and and so we're literally crucified between heaven and earth as a symbol and so when you look at a cross even though nobody's on it no body it's a it's a marvelous symbol of where the human condition is now mm. and to get out of that place requires an integration of of joy and sorrow of uh, of of hope and realistic self knowledge and 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 so it's not just one thing but the holistic development of all the human qualities that are inspired by a deep principle that most people can accept so if we can and science can ever convince us that we really are uh, one as a race and that everything that happens to one person affects us saint paul of course in his teaching on the mystical body goes into that from the, from a spiritual perspective that we we're, we're mutually supportive of each other and everyone is needed for the full health of the corporate body that is growing into the fullness we would say of christ or the fullness of the human family when it's fully evolved so we were talking a minute ago about how perhaps some sort of universal ethical uh, training might um, prevent people from developing such a, an a, a obtuse false self, you know, which causes so much trouble. And I was thinking that maybe that's a little bit of a top-down solution and that, in fact, your solution, which has been centering prayer, uh, might be more, you know, to the, to the root of the issue, that it would, that, that, ethical behavior might spontaneously spring from a deeper communion with God or with the innermost self um, and that would take care of the issue. So some sort of universal training at an early age in uh, something like um, centering prayer or contemplative prayer might really transform society. I'm sure you've had that thought. Yes, we've had that thought. (laughs) To be realistic, uh, a, a number of people will think, well, it comes from the Christian tradition and I'm not a Christian. Or some Christians who are very uh, uh, mi- literally minded will think, well, uh, this is not the way I understand the Bible and so on. Yeah, but I mean, you yourself have had a bit of an eclectic uh, background with regard to meditation. I, I know you were exposed to transcendental meditation back in the '70s, and um, I supp- would you su- agree that perhaps centering prayer could be adapted to any tradition? That within the context of any tradition, something like centering prayer could be taught that would be in conf- con- you know, oh sure, it, it oh, would, yeah, it would be harmonious right. with that religion. And it is true. Some of the other major religions have very similar uh, uh, traditions and teachings. Uh, centering prayer is a lot like uh, Zogchen in the Buddhist uh, Vajrayana tradition. It's a lot like transcendental and it's meditation a lot like, too. Uh, just sitting in yeah. Zen. It has. Uh, it's uh, not quite the same as Vipassana, which is a concentrative. Mm-hmm process which is good mental training to control the mind but centering prayer is a kind of receptive process so if anybody who can be receptive will benefit from it and and could uh, it could be presented and adapted to people without a religion so uh, like tell, we, uh, tell us what it is how does it I'm sorry go ahead we've taught it in prisons yeah Actually, in Folsom Prison, and there we discovered that when uh, other men on the yard saw their friends 
being more calm and peaceful and they asked them what it was and they asked to come to the weekly meeting that's all that the the authorities would grant mm. one night and sometimes there was a lockdown and they couldn't get there it's a, it's a tough prison is a very tough yeah. thing and not much is done for rehab well anyway those men who had no religion at all who came to the meetings regularly began to experience the same effects of of peace and calm and, and less impulsive reactions to uh, insults and things like that. In other words, they were becoming more human too. So, But uh, I, I, uh, you can't persuade people no. always to do this. So you can offer, and there are a number of, our, of efforts being made, not only by by centering prayer practice, but by other forms of meditation, like the World Community for Christian Meditation, founded by Dom John Main and uh, magnificently uh, uh, spread around the world by Lawrence Freeman, also a Benedictine monk. So what is centering prayer? How does it work? It doesn't work. <laughs> okay, well, describe the mechanics of it, if you will. <laughs> okay. Well, we have four major rules, and one is to make the intention of, of consenting to God's presence and action within us. By action, as I said earlier, we mean purification and the enhancement or enrichment of spiritual practice, that is, the practice of the virtues, forgiveness, understanding, service of human needs, so, so a lot depends on intention. So, whenever you sit down, that's the first thing to do is to resume your intention to consent, which is a, which is a kind of uh, enhanced form of acceptance. Acceptance is the basic relationship with God, but consent is a little more personal, a little more warm it's a welcoming of god's presence so that. so let's say that you're teaching me centering prayer right now and you're so you're going to tell me to sit down and to have the attitude of relinquishing control to consent to be willing yeah. malleable receptive give yourself to god or put yeah. yourself in god's hand right. not like fall I'm, into the hands of the living god as the scriptures say it's the safest place there is for some people. So it's not like I'm going to sit here and so not, the next, I'm going the to next do step, this, by golly. But four steps. Okay, so good. Step. The next step is is to introduce some sacred symbol that expresses that intention. Visual symbol, auditory symbol, thought? It can be a word. It can be the breath watching the breath. It can be a simple inward glance towards that deeper self that I spoke of earlier. But it's the not an external thing. It's not like some music you put on or something. It's more, it, it's inside. It's, it, it's totally uh, receptive of God alone. So it's a chance to just to be with God alone and to be, well, here I am, mm -hmm. dear Lord, at your disposal. And please... Uh, Heal my my faults when you uh, see that they're no longer of help to me. <laughs> so, so it, but it it's a single syllable. If you use a word, we call it a sacred word, and it can be a holy word, or it can be something that expresses a little more your disposition, like love or peace, forgive. Or it could be a mantra like Om or Shalom yes. or whatever. Yes. Be, mm -hmm. Okay. Or it could be the holy name of God. Mm -hmm. And you're not chanting it out loud. It's it's mental. No, it's, it's totally interior, and okay. you don't say it in centering prayer mm -hmm. as a mantra, which is said repeatedly, deliberately. It's only used when you need it. That is to say, when the bombardment of thoughts gets a little overwhelming, and you and you think you're going to have to uh, 
they can't put up with it much longer. So uh, let, not, me, let me just interject a question here that someone sent in to, to ask you uh, on this very point. They said, in your guidelines for centering prayer, one chooses a sacred word and introduces it with eyes closed. And when one becomes distracted by thoughts, one returns to the sacred word. What does one do between introducing the sacred word and before becoming distracted by thoughts if one is just a beginner? Specifically speaking, does one introduce the sacred word once or can one keep thinking the sacred word over and over again in the beginning stage? Well, the crucial distinction is are you having thoughts or are you engaged in the thoughts? So if you're having thoughts, this is normal and impossible to avoid. That The brain is a kind of receptor set and you can't do anything about that. So it's like a river with boats going on top of it. You can't stop the boats, but you cannot, you can stop yourself from getting on a boat to see what's in the hole. <laughs> so you just let them come, let them go. And as time goes on, the capacity to let go of thoughts that you don't want becomes more and more a second nature. But it takes time. It's not a, a one-time success story. So let's say that I my... have my to do it regularly because we have habits of the opposite of constantly thinking about every blasted thing that happens. It's an exercise in not thinking or detachment from thinking. It's not thinking is wrong, it's that we've abused it to the point where we can't think under, uh, as a rule under our own initiative when we don't have some special project we're thinking about. So, so engage, when you notice you're engaged with the thought, like uh, have a thought, what are we going to have for dinner? Where is it going to be a steak? Well, as soon as you get into the contents of the meal, you're engaged, you might say. And then you ever so gently, ever so gently, because this is not a success story or our project, it's surrendering to the invitation of God to learn how to be rather than, and that this is a very, this is even more important than doing. And so you keep returning patiently again and again, maybe a hundred times. To the sacred word, you're free to return, but you don't say it like you're hanging on to a life preserver, because then you've got it's become an egoic project, or you don't look for success, or you don't look for consolation or peace. You just are present to God's presence and action, and in, over and over again, renewing that intention. So you don't think about the sacred word or whatever your symbol is. You just do it. And sometimes as you get more proficient, you even start to do it is enough to return to your... And also you sometimes experience an attraction towards a deeper silence. And, and this is a good sign that you've connected with this practice. And in that silence, you, it's consciousness without content, so that a presence best describes it, rather than a thought or a desire. It's just it's a sense of being in God or God in us and, and wanting to be there. So you keep that up for, we suggest, 20 minutes in the beginning because it takes most people that much time to even quiet down. And we suggest doing it twice a day for at least 20 minutes. Every meditation requires at least 20 minutes just because the mind is so co-opted by habits of, of thinking and of choosing that are related to those three basic instincts, security, need, power control, uh, affection, and esteem. And the body takes a Pretty while to soon settle down too because your defenses go down over time, the purification begins. That is to say, thoughts that are in the unconscious that we repress because they were too traumatic to handle in childhood begin to come to our awareness and consciousness. And then you, you just acknowledge them and give them to God. And if you want to think about it more fully, you do so after the prayer is over. 
So will people be able to practice centering pair based on our conversation, or is there some kind of formal instruction needed? We have a formal instruction that we recommend, mm -hmm. but some have picked it up from the books or from a pamphlet that describes the process. Okay. But it, it, it has a certain subtlety. It's as simple as could be, but simplicity for humans is the organization of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So you uh, you need uh, the help of others and sometimes uh, to make a, a uh, intensive where you do more sitting mm -hmm. uh, but above all uh, to find a place to carve out a place for it in a very, in a very active lives that we lead in the American culture requires motivation mm -hmm. determination so we hope that people realize just how illusory the false self is, so that sometimes the best preparation for centering prayer is is some incident that brings to our attention just how little we actually know about anything. <laughs> um, so if I were practicing centering prayer, let's say, and let's say my sacred word was love, and yeah. I'm sitting there, I sit and close my eyes, maybe I wait for half a minute just to let myself settle down a little bit. Good idea. Yeah, well, like, a few deep breaths. Yeah, a few deep breaths, and then I introduce the word love. I, and I don't think I don't say love, love, love. I just think it once. I'm I'm just repeating your instructions yeah. here. And then I just sit and enjoy the presence. And then next thing I know, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow. And as soon as I realize that I've wandered off onto that thought, mm -hmm. I I come back. I just think love. Mm -hmm. I sit again, and that's pretty much the process, right? Yes. Yeah. Then at the at the end, when your 20 minutes is up. Mm -hmm. Uh, you sit for another minute and a half or so to allow the whatever has happened to the nervous system to settle down and work its way into our other uh, active faculties so we can bring maybe hopefully a little of the peace we've received or experienced into daily life or into relationships that are difficult. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that as you settle into this more deeply restful state, then buried, whatever you want to call it, um, junk <laughs> in yes. in the nervous system or in the psyche begins to bubble up because it's a, it has the opportunity to begin to release, which it doesn't if we're running around like crazy people. But once we settle yes. down, it has the opportunity to start. Yes. Yeah. So it naturally, the body naturally gets rid of, of negative or, or harmful influences mm -hmm. if we allow it. That's right. It, it, yeah, it has a natural tendency help. to want to do that, right? Well, it's habituated not yeah. to do it, or or even not to even know that it's possible to yeah. do anything different from what we're doing. So we're really uh, pretty much enslaved to a culture where where you are always thinking about how to resolve a problem instead of accepting it and moving on. So when people so are sitting in daily and life, is good, it now becomes a lot more meaningful, and and the sense of God's presence is liable to appear in in daily events. Mm -hmm. You're more sensitive to the divine action, and uh, it's it's really like looking at the prayer itself, at boats going down a river. The current will take them all away if you just wait a minute. Just don't get on the boats. Let them go by. That's, that's the purpose of the word. It's not anything profound that it offers. It just gives you a chance for the true self to begin to have a, have a little breathing space. And, and because it exists, it starts to function. When people are sitting notice in... also that... Uh, in your relationship with others, you notice sometimes your faults, and you, you notice why did I get so angry at that statement? Because it didn't seem proportionate. So you begin to be. Uh, this Holy Spirit begins to show you how you might improve your your uh, response to people's difficulties or challenges or. And things like that. So, 
it does help to get through great trials also like some people are suffering a great loss the prayer for them will, will uh, pretty well establish in it over some months will will help them to let their feelings come and to grieve and to let them go without being as deeply blown away as they used to be by difficulties or tragedy. And this is something I think we all need in our time where the media provide you with all the woes all over the world every few hours. If you look at television, or, so you not only have a weekly journal, but every day this bombardment of everything that's violent or going wrong or injustice everywhere in the world. And, uh, this can't be good for people. I mean, you need a, some kind of a break, even a phone break, because when you get on the phone, your neighbors will bring up all these topics. So, so the this mass media has its limitations, and we have to figure out a way to balance our day so we're not overwhelmed with depressing thoughts. We need to have some beauty to to live in this world. It's, uh, nature seems to be intended for that purpose. So when people are sitting in centering prayer and they they enter a deeply restful state and some of this kind of repressed uh, negativity or conflict begins to bubble up, can they expect to experience um, negative emotions, anger, fear, sadness. Um, That's exactly what they experience. Turbulence. Whatever they repress. Got to come out. It needs to come out in order for the full capacities of the positive energies to function. Mm -hmm. And these are the, uh, are the faculties of grace, like love, yeah. compassion, forgiveness, understanding, inclination to serve, knowing how to listen, all of these capacities that are buried under the load of, of our own uh, feelings of neglect or whatever has bothered us mm. begin to diminish. I don't say they're all taken away all of a sudden, but they don't blow you away the way they used to. That's yeah, and you're, you have to keep doing this, and and if you do, you'll be attracted to other practices for daily life, and also perhaps begin to lengthen the time that you give to this sitting, waiting, listening, total receptivity, alert passivity. All these things are not very congenial in modern contemporary. Uh, professional lifestyle so they have to be learned again but the body and the, and the human organism is completely prepared for this and will revive and, and then you discover that you have the capacity for the whole contemplative journey within you and you, you don't have to do it you let it happen it, it does you yeah um, you mentioned in your book that Centering prayer is preparation for contemplation, if, if I got you right. Uh, so that sounds like contemplation is a second stage or something that's... Well, ending there, how you define contemplation, if you mean a, a, a broad program, then centering prayer is a first step, let us say, in a process. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking in that context, maybe I didn't make it sufficiently clear that the... Uh, that the actual fruits and gifts of the Spirit in prayer that give one a sense of reassurance or being loved by God or, or a peace or everything is okay, these contemplative dispositions uh, don't necessarily arise at once. But as you do the prayer, they begin to become a little more frequent in one's not only prayer but daily life. I see what you mean. So it's, it's as though the centering prayer uh, opens us up to a realm of experience that be, that provides a, a foundation of sorts with, and, and then spon almost spontaneously from that spring a, a, springs a greater sense of God's presence, of trust, of, yes. of acceptance, of the, you know, the inherent and wisdom in the universe and so on. 
and a perception of his action in our daily life. You see, he brings people into our lives, or a book, or or a phone call, or a, an event that we need to see something about ourselves that has been hidden from us and that would help our spiritual. In other words, we begin to enter into this psychotherapeutic relationship with God in which he deals with our unconscious and our temperamental defects and our personality disorders in a way that is almost incredible because the divine wisdom knows us through and through and still loves us infinitely. So we, we see how God is teaching us with such great patience, tenderness, and consideration, and how he waits for us, how he chooses the right moment to give us a special grace, like on a retreat or, or some event in our lives that opens us to a deep place in our emotional life. Nothing wrong with the emotions. It's the, mostly resisting them that is the problem because we're afraid of the feeling. But once we accept the fact that we're in God's care and we're, we're in a therapeutic relationship with God, then the office begins to expand to the whole of your life and everything you do. You can turn to God and say, well, what will I do about this? What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? In other words, there's a sense of companionship or being lived in and, uh, and I say sometimes uh, God plays his games and he, he goes away someplace without telling you seeming, just to see what you'll do with that or whether you'll blame him or whether how far you're willing to play the divine games uh, one game he likes is, is, is to play basketball with us as the ball <laughs> And so the harder the ball hits the floor, the higher it rises. Mm. So we have to learn that sometimes the bigger the trial, in our view, the greater the transformation that will come from it. So, so we begin to learn the way God works, and it's not according to appearances. Another trick is when you want to make a basket, you have to dribble, so the ball hits the floor, boom, 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 boom. That's when difficulties pile up one right after the other but it's the only way you get to the basket mm. if that's what you're doing so uh, and so uh, just to recapitulate so you're saying that you know centering prayer 20 minutes or so twice a day uh, is not only restful in and of itself but it will over time uh, help to develop a, a kind of a, a vision that or, or a view of the world that that everything is divinely orchestrated. It's not arbitrary and capricious, but there's actually a, a sort of a loving intelligence, which we could call God, which is helping to bring about our progress on our own, our evolution. Just to put it in the yes. yeah. In other words, you're in a relationship with God. Right. And th this is the word that most many theologians today prefer to person, because person has has a certain context in the East. Uh, I found that many uh, Eastern teachers thought when we spoke of God as a person, we meant personality, which of course would be a kind of childish idea of God. God is, may not be a person, but my feeling is whatever, whatever he can be, he is. And so. He, he at least he treats us in a personal way because that's our level of consciousness. Some Eastern perspectives have it that the, that God has both impersonal and personal aspects. You know, I would agree with that because yeah. I mean, uh, he's impersonal with stones and he's personal with people. Yeah, very so, adjustable. God is so accommodating. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the universe really works in spite of all the astronomical catastrophes and out of that terrible chaos emerges the human consciousness which is a masterpiece of organization mm. that is still going on. And if we could collaborate with it, we have no idea of what wonderful things human race might be capable of 
in the next millennium. Well, if we think of that, uh, you know, what the human race might be capable of, perhaps we can get a hint by seeing what an individual is capable of if that individual really progresses far along the spiritual path. So maybe at this phase of the interview, which is probably going to be the last phase, you could lay out for us what you see as the a kind of a road map of spiritual progress from very preliminary stages to the ultimate stage, if there is an ultimate stage. Now what, what does a person go through? What have you gone through uh, as, you know, <laughs> over these decades? And, uh, uh, well, it, it is not anything I expected, I for sure. And, uh, and I've, uh, I've, I've been a poor uh, playmate, I'm sure, for, for the uh, wonderful opportunities that God has, uh, has given me. Uh, but I, I, I think that if you put the human development in the context of evolution, you see that there's a certain uh, unity of purpose or organization or experience. Like, like in biology, the earlier forms of life uh, grow by movement or by uh, complexity. I think biologists would say. And then all of a sudden, a new levels of consciousness, and the animal comes into it, and then mammals, and then hominids. So there's a certain progression. And then humans. Well, humans, we don't know how they started out. That's a matter of controversy among the religions. But all that we know is, as of now, the human development with Piaget and company uh, recapitulates the whole movement of evolutionary progress from matter to life, to higher forms of life, more complex life, conscious life, life capable of more and more complex movement, and then the human brain developing to its present level, which is the, apparently the largest in, uh, among the primates. So, so our spiritual journey then, our relationship to God is going to reflect that context. So, so we start off as children thinking of God as dad and mom, or father or mother, or parenting us. And then later on he becomes a, a companion, or, or a friend, or a soulmate, or, or then he becomes a, a lover, or a, or a engaged person. Person or, or or our spouse, and then uh, then we can look upon God as fulfilling all kinds of other relations. In other words, God is so adaptable you can you can uh, count on Him for any relationship. But there's a certain progression of intimacy and transformation that takes place in that human development. That. Uh, it, it involves a, a, a communion with God that is permanent, that is a stage of consciousness, that is like living in a house that has a certain atmosphere of presence that, that never goes away. And then you find out that the same presence is, is outside the house. So, so he, the spiritual journey seems to have integrating our turbulent, a trivial daily life of down to earth things to be done and so with the fact that we're called to the most sublime uh, communion or union that can be conceived of namely to become it, as much as possible equal to God now why he ch chose this plan you'll have to ask him of course but it, it seems to be repeated in, in outstanding mystics, contemplative sages, and saints. Uh, so at some point then, uh, union, let us say, like St. John of the Dis Cross describes a Christian perfection as, as a bridal union, and we just we're celebrating on the Feast of Epiphany that grace of bridal union with, with God and, and with Christ. 
So what happens after that? Transforming union introduces one to a whole new set of circumstances and cap capabilities and possibilities which move towards a, uh, what is called non-dual consciousness or unity consciousness or the death of the separate self-sense, which is the ultimate cause separation of all our problems in the first place, even more fundamental than the false self. It's the idea of being separate from security or love or control that causes the uh, developing infant to look for gratification in the exaggeration of those, uh, or the gratification of those desires in its, in its re relationships to parents, teachers, and, and other folks. So uh, the goal seems to be to move into the realization that our deepest self really is, is God's presence in us, which does not forestall our uniqueness but which manifests the divine dispositions in this very uh, virtually uh, deprived evolution creature who hasn't evolved from this animal conscious enough. You still have, we all have still our, our animal brain in the back, which you have to have to survive in this life. So the divine and the human then in, 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 in the evolutionary process have come together and are battling to see uh, whether we're going to evolve into a divine human being in Christianity uh, manifested by Christ's example and teaching or we're going to keep regressing to the instinctual responses of our animal nature which uh, lead to violence and all the other uh, negative emotions that will hinder us from moving as a, as a community or a race into a divine union. So, I know you're a modest man and you may not want to talk about your own experience, but have you gone through the stages that you just described in that union with God and then further maturation into non-dual unity? Well, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> that it it's not a uh, a ski toe that takes you up uh, non-stop to the top of your uh, mm -hmm. ski slope it's something you're working on all the time and having lived to be almost 90 I can see there's a lot of work yet on the unconscious that God can do to, so that my all my actions are moved by uh, Christ within and so so one of my responses to the question about reincarnation is that what reincarnates in us is the word of God made flesh is Christ and that Christ is becoming us in order to make us into what he is the uh, bosom companion or the reality of of God, as Jesus said, the Father and I are one. This is not a numerical assertion, but a quality of life and consci uh, consciousness in which everything one does is is more or less saturated with this presence that is always there, along with the trivia of the house of God or the bosom of God, or if you prefer a fleshly image of the womb of God. So in, in this sense, we're all in the womb of God getting ready to be uh, go through the birth canal to eternal life. <laughs> in terms of Christ, 
perhaps we should have discussed this earlier, but you just brought it up, so it's a good time. When you consider the size of the universe, I'm sure you've you know studied astronomy a bit and seen presentations, and it's just vast beyond comprehension. And these days they're finding in uh, you know planets around most stars, and and a good many of them apparently in the Goldilocks zone, you know, which might be habitable, not too hot, not too cold. Mm -hmm. So so let's presume that the the universe is actually teeming with life. And that a good deal of that life has evolved to, you know, at least the level of our species. Um, where does, how does Christ come in with all that? I mean, we think of Christ as this guy who lived 2,000 years ago. I mean, would 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 he be on tour, <laughs> going to all these inhabited places, or does each planet have its own Christ? And is Christ more of a universal principle that was manifest in Jesus of Nazareth, uh, but that could also be manifest in? billions of other highly evolved s souls who are ministering to their respective planets? Uh, sure, well, we don't know the answers to those questions, but we don't have to be afraid of them if you have a, a Christian perspective, because it's the word is made flesh in Jesus. He's also made flesh in each of us. So, so in a sense, we also are incarnations of God. Hmm but we would consider that in a very, in much more limited sense in which uh, the, the word was made flesh. So he possesses the human nature of Christ. So in that view, Christ is, is a divine person possessing a human nature and that we are going to participate in the same structural relationship with God as we negotiate our, our complex journey into non-duality and no self in the sense of the false self and the ego. So the false self and the ego have no future. They're illusions and so God can't support them. But we do need a, a developed ego to survive in this world. So how you deal with that is precisely the conundrum or the paradoxes of everyday life. Well, don't you and find God in your own experience seeing how well we do that? And I mean, we'd be very proud of us to see us struggling. Don't you find that there's something multidimensional, though, in your own experience where, you know, sure, you have an ego, which you need functionally in order to get through the door, you know, yeah. or go, go and eat lunch. And on the other hand, you know, there are dimensions which are beyond the ego, which are impersonal, and somehow the whole, all those strata coexist nicely together. That's what's called simplicity, or holy simplicity, when, mm. when all the levels of which human nature are careful are, are well developed and integrated, one with the other, and in a hierarchical fashion in some way. It doesn't mean that one state of life is necessarily better than another, but it does mean that they're different, and that the difference is important to the overall completion of this uh, what the, uh, Christians call the mystical body of Christ, which is his glorified body after his resurrection. So, so Christ, remember, was at work from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. The man, Jesus Christ, is a historical figure, Christians believe, owned or possessed by the word of God, but which is not the same as as Christ as God. And Christ as God can continue to have manifestations of, of the Word of God of, of all kinds in other planets, other places. Mm -hmm. But it's basically the same movement but expressed in different ways and on different planets it would not be the historical context that we're familiar with the Word made flesh. But this doesn't diminish either Christ or, or the other avatars or whatever God wants to make them. But it, it's going to take some ingenuity <laughs> to, to figure out how to get to these other planets because they're a long way off. And I think they'll figure out a way of going faster than light. But it might take a little time. But what we discover in the other areas will be fascinating. But we need to be prepared to deal with that new kind of relationship. If they're better than us, how are you going to get on? You have to grow out of the narrow-mindedness of, of 
much of the human race that puts nation or religion ahead of the basic goodness of being human as a member of this exalted but rather humble race. And if we do go there, I think what we'll find is that very same presence of God is just as is just as much saturating everything there as it is right here. So, Absolutely. Yes. So in, a, in that sense, we're already there. Yes, we are. As Teilhard de Chardin says that God is present in every subatomic particle. Well, that, that means it's another way of saying God is omnipresent or is everywhere. Yeah. That's kind there's of how we another, started this. There's discussion. another factor we may discover that time is, is and space are just constructions of our intellect, part of our way of seeing the world, and, and, and that there may be other planets that have a different kind of structure, mm. quite different. But that God will be just as present to, and, and, uh, and perhaps uh, if you think of yourself as actually an icon of God or a, uh, or a unique expression of the word made flesh of God becoming human, then God's remarkable response to Job uh, comes into a new focus. Uh, if you remember that story, Job got very angry at God because he felt mistreated. He'd been a very good man and God allowed him to be tempted by the, by the devil, according to the early text. But he had every kind of problem, loss of family, reputation, business, his, his body, and he finally got left with being covered with sores, so he was utterly miserable. So he says, his friends come to kind of console him with pious platitudes, which he doesn't accept. He said, I didn't do anything wrong. God is unjust and I want to bring him to judgment. So God finally appears and, and, and it's the presence of God that answers all his questions. And he, he then lovingly eats humble pie and God then restores to him ten times as much as he had before, mm. which God can always do. But there's one uh, sentence that is very uh, intriguing. God opens the conversation by saying, well, where were you when I formed the cosmos and made the stars and fixed the earth? Now, was God just sort of uh, ironically teasing him or, or was God actually trying to lead him in the psychotherapeutic <laughs> method to a new understanding of who Job was? The answer and God was trying to evoke from him the answer. I was there too. Yeah. That is to say, everything when you're in union with God, you are co-creating with God and maybe everything in the past as well as everything in the future. In other words, equality with God is quite something. And I don't know why people want to become president of this or that company when you when you got a, a gilded invitation to become everything in union with God in a relationship that is totally loving and self-giving. In other words, we don't think big enough of God. We judge him by our own limitations, I think, and negative feelings. Sometimes God wants to play at being president of a company. Now, if, if people could be president of a company and yet aware of their oneness with God, then we might have more... Yes, that's the, that's we the idea. We might have better companies. We have to do a little more evolving to get to that place, but it's mm. certainly within our range and possible. Yeah. So if people would put their minds on becoming God too, not in the sense of power, but in the sense of serving every living thing as far as they have the talents to do so, then yeah. then the world would become the Garden of Eden. I'm sure it's that's some... That's we can make, we are, have to make it the Garden of Eden, or we can make it hell. The false self makes its own hell. 
Some Christians would hear you say that and consider it blasphemous, but it bears repeating that you're not talking about the individual false self becoming God. You're talking about well, realization of that level of life at which you know we and God are, are one. Yes, and discovering that it's always been that way. We right. just thought it was different because we didn't have the symbols that we could teach us. Yeah, and again, centering prayer. We have to end on a practical well, note. Well, it's a very humble start of <laughs> just shutting up and sitting down and yeah. letting God be God. It's a useful tool. And the bottom line is always uh, love. Uh, love God with our whole mind, heart, soul, and strength is the vision statement of Judeo-Christian religion and to love one another as God has loved us, or at least as we love ourselves, this is the mission. So, if and centering prayer is only designed to help you do that. I mean. Good. Well, I've really enjoyed this discussion because, um, you know, personally, I although I have never been a religious person, I over the years have gotten more and more um, appreciative of. God really and, and I can't you know and sometimes discussions in contemporary spirituality are somewhat dry you know they they just sort of emphasize the absolute value without any kind of uh, divine quality to it and um, that doesn't jibe with my orientation or my experience and so you know it's it's been sort of delight it's been delightful reading your book and having this conversation with someone who's for whom that orientation has been very strong your entire life, pretty much. Uh, pretty much from um, <laughs> age 18. Um, yeah. That's about the age at which I turn, it, turned I'm it around. Still, but I'm still... Uh, lots to do. It's up to God to decide how long he wants to work with my limitations. Mm. And he can take them all away in a nanosecond of time, too, if if you get shot or bombed, there's, there's nothing that can prevent God's love from happening. And so if he's called us, as he says he has, then there's nothing to be afraid of. Good point. Whatever we're scared of, sit with it and, and give it to God. Trust. Gratitude and trust in God and self-surrender, that those are the transformations of consciousness we're working towards in contemplative prayers, I understand it. Very good. But religion does need to make sure that it's leading people and teaching people to go in this direction. Otherwise, it's it, seems to me it's not really meeting its its purpose and call. It's mm. getting too involved in externals or rituals or structures. They're important, but only up to a point. They're not ends in themselves. So, so uh, God can work independently of religion. He has many ways of bringing people to himself. Some people have been so damaged by religious misinformation or mis malformation that they can't go that way and they have to at least have a period of, of freedom. But God is sheer freedom, liberation, and, and this is the disposition that we're invited into it total freedom so that you can be God too without pride or, or attributing it to yourself but, but have a sense of immense gratitude to God for even thinking of you <laughs> so everyone is in God's thoughts it occurred to me as you said that that 
everything has something to contribute. Religion has something to contribute. Science has something to contribute. Uh, the non-religious sort of uh, spirituality that's in vogue these days has, you know, the people say, um, I'm spiritual but not religious. That has something to yeah. contribute. Absolutely. And, and if all these things could just let their guard down a little bit and, you know, be open to the gifts that are, you know, that each has to give, then there would be a kind of a mutual enrichment that would make everything more vibrant and healthy. You're, you're describing the interspiritual movement that I'm very much a part of. Oh, I interviewed Kurt Johnson last week. You know Kurt? Um, he yeah, just he's very prominent in that. Yeah, he just wrote that book, The Coming Interspiritual Age. Yes, it's, it's yeah. a marvelous uh, compilation of all there is to say about that up till now. But it's just moving forward. Well, my take on it is that we have reason for optimism, you know, that the signs are there, that uh, as you were saying earlier on, there's a kind of a mass awakening taking place, and that somehow all these intractable problems and, and institutions which seem to be so opposed to human happiness and betterment, they they don't stand a chance. They, everything will kind of fall away or, or, or just transform itself as this invincible upwelling of spirit takes place as it as it seems to be doing with greater and greater um, force and, and speed yes well we, we we need to keep our humility here and 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 we're not necessarily called to transform the world well I'm not saying it's we us doing contribute it. to it yeah we can be uh, like a humble contribution sure there's a there's a verse in the in the Hindu scriptures, where um, there was this huge rainstorm because Indra got mad at the follower, uh, at the, the villagers in Vrindavan uh, because they were worshiping Krishna, and he got jealous. So Krishna, they begged to Krishna to protect them, and he came and picked up a mountain and held it over the village to protect them from the, this deluge. Mm -hmm. And then all the villagers thought, oh, he can't hold up that mountain all by himself. I better take a stick and help him hold it. So they all grabbed sticks and they were holding, helping hold up the mountain. Of course, they weren't doing anything at all. Krishna was doing it all. <laughs> yeah. So you and I are just holding sticks here. Yes, that's a good image we're doing. <laughs> uh, it, it's amazing how God makes use of a very, a very defective uh, instruments to bring about amazing results. And, but we may have to wait. Who knows what God has in mind? All I can say is, at least in my experience, that however bad the situation is, if you're on this journey to transformation, God is working to transform it into a very valuable assistant or, or part of your spiritual journey. This, this, to really be united to God is what gives God glory. So he'll turn the world upside down to bring someone who's willing to the ultimate uh, unity consciousness. Beautiful. Well, I better let you go. I promised I wouldn't go on too much longer than this, and we're depriving everyone else in the monastery of their Internet access right now because you're hogging all the bandwidth. So <laughs> um, yeah. we better let them get back to it. So uh, let me just make some concluding remarks. Um, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to have this conversation. It's really been a, an honor for me to, to speak with you like this. You're welcome, and thank you yeah. for your interest. Good. And uh, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, this interview is one in a continuing series. I do about one a week. And if you'd like to um, see some of the others, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and there you'll find them all archived. There's also a YouTube channel where they're all there, and you can subscribe to that. Um, at batgap.com, you'll find a little tab on, on the website where you can sign up to be notified by email each time there's a new interview. Uh, there's also a discussion group that um, crops up around each interview. Each, each one has its own little discussion group, so feel free to participate in that if you wish. Uh, there's a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking if they feel able. 
And uh, there's also a link to an audio podcast uh, so that you can subscribe to that. And each time a new interview is posted, it will automatically come into your iTunes account and you can put it on your iPod and listen to it while you're skiing or whatever, which I would be doing if I were in Snowmass, Colorado at the moment. <laughs> well, thank you for your interest in this the most important uh, issue for human beings, whether they want to become God on their own terms or on God's terms. Mm. They haven't done too well on their own terms up till now, so they might try this one. Yeah, good Let point. Let God be God. And, uh, but uh, you're working hard at trying to invite people into this dialogue and whether you call it the interspiritual dialogue or whatever, it's it seems to me that it's, it's a great contribution to thought today because people are not thinking automatically or they don't have too many opportunities to think of these things. And if they have these opportunities that you're providing, I think they'll see the continuity and the common ground that uh, gradually emerges from all those who are sincere seekers, whether they're religious or not mm -hmm. yes okay well I'll say goodbye then goodbye Father Keating thank you very much again. yeah absolutely I, I really hope um, if I ever travel west or get out to Colorado I'll stop by and see you yes please do okay okay thank you bye bye